If you enjoy these videos, then please consider liking them and subscribing to the channel for more similar content. If you'd like to contribute, then please also consider becoming a channel member or you can make a donation via Buy Me A Coffee. All of your support is very much appreciated. Chapter 7 Attitude Experiments recently conducted by Merle Lawrence, Princeton, and Adalbert Ames, Dartmouth, in the latter's psychology laboratory at Hanover, New Hampshire, prove that what you see when you look at something depends not so much on what is there as on the assumption you make when you look. Since what we believe to be the real physical world is actually only an assumptive world, it is not surprising that these experiments prove that what appears to be solid reality is actually the result of expectations or assumptions. Your assumptions determine not only what you see, but also what you do, for they govern all your conscious and subconscious movements towards the fulfillment of themselves. Over a century ago, this truth was stated by Emerson as follows. As the world was plastic and fluid in the hands of God, so it is ever to so much of his attributes as we bring to it. To ignorance and sin, it is flint, they adapt themselves to it as they may. But in proportion as man has anything in him divine, the firmament flows before him and takes his signet and form. Your assumption is the hand of God moulding the firmament into the image of that which you assume. The assumption of the wish fulfilled is the high tide which lifts you easily off the bar of the senses where you have so long lain stranded. It lifts the mind into prophecy in the full right sense of the word. And if you have that controlled imagination and absorbed attention which is possible to attain, you may be sure that all your assumption implies will come to pass. When William Blake wrote, what seems to be is, to those to whom it seems to be, he was only repeating the eternal truth. There is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Romans 14.14 14. Because there is nothing unclean of itself, or clean of itself, you should assume the best and think only of that which is lovely and of good report. Philippians 4.8 It is not superior insight, but ignorance of this law of assumption. If you read into the greatness of men some littleness with which you may be familiar, or into some situation or circumstance, an unfavourable conviction, your particular relationship to another influences your assumption with respect to that other and makes you see in him that which you do see. If you can change your opinion of another, then what you now believe of him cannot be absolutely true, but is only relatively true. The following is an actual case history, illustrating how the law of assumption works. One day, a costume designer described to me her difficulties in working with a prominent theatrical producer. She was convinced that he unjustly criticised and rejected her best work and that often he was deliberately rude and unfair to her. Upon hearing her story, I explained that if she found the other rude and unfair, it was a sure sign that she, herself, was wanting and that it was not the producer, but herself, that was in need of a new attitude. I told her that the power of this law of assumption and its practical application could be discovered only through experience and only by assuming that the situation was already what she wanted it to be could she prove that she could bring about the change desired. Her employer was merely bearing witness, telling her by his behaviour what her concept of him was. I suggested that it was quite probable that she was carrying on conversations with him in her mind which were filled with criticism and recriminations. There was no doubt but that she was mentally arguing with the producer, for others only echo that which we whisper to them in secret. I asked her if it was not true that she talked to him mentally and, if so, what those conversations were like. She confessed that every morning on her way to the theatre, she told him just what she thought of him in a way she would never have dared address him in person. The intensity and force of her mental arguments with him 
automatically established his behaviour towards her. She began to realise that all of us carry on mental conversations, but, unfortunately, on most occasions, these conversations are argumentative, that we only have to observe the passerby on the street to prove this assertion, that so many people are mentally engrossed in conversation, and few appear to be happy about it, but the very intensity of their feeling must lead them quickly to the unpleasant incident they themselves have mentally created and therefore must now encounter. When she realised what she had been doing, she agreed to change her attitude and to live this law faithfully by assuming that her job was highly satisfactory and her relationship with the producer was a very happy one. To do this, she agreed that before going to sleep at night, on her way to work and at other intervals during the day, she would imagine that he had congratulated her on her fine designs and that she, in turn, had thanked him for his praise and kindness. To her great delight, she soon discovered for herself that her own attitude was the cause of all that befell her. The behaviour of her employer miraculously reversed itself, his attitude, echoing as it had always done that which she had assumed, now reflected her changed concept of him. What she did was by the power of her imagination. Her persistent assumption influenced his behaviour and determined his attitude towards her. With the passport of desire on the wings of a controlled imagination, she travelled into the future of her own predetermined experience. Thus we see it is not facts, but that which we create in our imagination which shapes our lives. For most of the conflicts of the day are due to the want of a little imagination to cast the beam out of our own eye. It is the exact and literal-minded who live in a fictitious world. As this designer, by her controlled imagination, started the subtle change in her employer's mind, so can we, by the control of our own imagination and wisely directed feeling, solve our problems. By the intensity of her imagination and feeling, the designer cast a kind of enchantment on her producer's mind and caused him to think that his generous praise originated with him. Often our most elaborate and original thoughts are determined by another. We should never be certain that it was not some woman treading in the wine press who began that subtle change in men's minds, or that the passion did not begin in the mind of some shepherd boy lighting up his eyes for a moment before it ran upon its way. William Butler Yeats so this chapter really couldn't be any clearer or more concise. Neville references Adalbert Ames's experiment that proves that you create your own reality. Since then we've got the double slit experiment and the uh, observer effect. Really just to emphasise science now telling us what ancient scriptures have always said is that we create our own reality. Neville gives us the example of the theatre worker and her experience in changing her attitude and it, it really does just come down to you should assume the best and think only of that which is lovely and of good report. Philippians, you experience what you expect to experience. If you think the world is a scary place, that's what you'll experience. You know, if you think people are inherently evil or not to be trusted you know again that's what you're going to experience i'll be honest i used to be pretty quick to judge people and that definitely had a negative impact on my relationships uh, in the past in the present one relationship with uh, someone i've had very negative they were really combative manipulative a really difficult person to uh, deal with and because of that that was how I saw them and I, I dwelt on it and like the uh, woman in Neville's story I was mentally rehearsing arguments it proved that the relationship was very difficult one day I just suddenly realized that you know how much of this is my fault you know quite possibly all of it I mean this person I'm talking about is well known throughout this area as a very difficult person 
someone that you wouldn't want to spend time with and uh, you know let's leave it at that but the fact that everybody else had that belief um, so I felt like I wasn't alone and it kind of reinforced confirmed that you know my thoughts and feelings towards this person were understandable and okay but in rereading Neville's work it it just it dawned on me how much of this was my fault how much was I antagonizing this situation by having these mental rehearsals of arguments so one day I realized that yes I was being judgmental towards this person instead of compassionate instead of having empathy I was choosing to view this person uh, in a negative light and so going forward I decided in my head just to show this person love instead of judging I decided to use my empathy I decided to wish them the best I decided to let go of the past not hold it against them but to instead view this person as someone who's in pain and acting out like you would a toddler you wouldn't admonish a toddler for throwing a little tantrum it, they're a toddler it's what they do and so I felt that this person was just in pain in their life and so acted out and I'd been the brunt of it but going forward I decided empathy compassion and love and lo and behold the next time I saw them it was a completely different different situation they were really helpful you know really pleasant and uh, a very very different outcome to what I was used to it, it really does just show the power of your attitude your reality is what you expect to see now I, I don't know if it's true or not I've I remember reading that when Columbus brought his ships to America the Native Americans stood on the beach couldn't actually see the ships it wasn't a part of their reality it wasn't something they could comprehend but the Native American shaman upon standing on the beach for several hours began to see a different pattern in the sea where the ships were and finally he could comprehend them whether it's true or not to me it's always said your reality is what you expect it to be and I, I keep saying this but as Neville says repetition is just so important in this line of work stop filling your conscious and subconscious mind with negative stories it will program into you that the world is a bad place before I go to sleep at night I usually watch a, a bit of TV just something something funny just to uh, dewind at the end of the day and um, on my iPad it brought up all of today's news and it was all very very dreary negative stuff and uh, you know, I really made me think, you know, how many people are constantly watching this stuff, reading it? It is such a negative way to uh, live your life. My wife used to watch some wild campers on YouTube and one of them turned into a prepper. His later videos, after he turned into a prepper, the titles like the end of the world, this is coming, that's coming, economic collapse, you know, you name it, all of it and uh, just reading the titles almost made me depressed but obviously for people like him that is their reality they expect that to happen if you think the world is going to collapse or you know whatever then you're going to experience it in some way maybe you'll lose your job whatever will happen but if you assume the worst then you are going to get the worst much better then to assume the best and only think of the best and then that's what you'll experience <laughs>